Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about what is going on in Germany. What are the reasons and the implications of its move to the right? Our guest for this show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. We may catch up with Manfred Henningsen, who's emeritus professor at UH Manoa in political science, who's come back from Germany recently in the next few days. In any event, Jean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. So what, what in the world is going on here? I mean, I, I thought that the German people had mm, shoved off from Nazism uh, and neo-Nazism, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, uh, the, the movement of neo-Nazis uh, seems to be growing in, in popularity and effect. Um, I know you've been following this to some extent. Can you tell us what's going on and where and who? There is a relatively new political party in Germany called the Alternative for Germany, Alternative for Deutschland. And um, <clears throat> it, it showed up early on before it had a name uh, around 2011 to 2013. You know, a lot of things happened around 2013. Uh, in 2014, we know that Russia invaded Crimea with little green men. And uh, everything that happens in, in Europe has an impact on everything else. Um, mm. Originally, it was considered a party of intellectuals. A lot of the people had doctorates. So it, it was founded by an elite class, you might say. And um, what it is, is a considered to be a, a right-wing alternative uh, for German politics. And that means really right-wing. To a certain extent, it's been denounced in epithets as neo-Nazi, but I think that's way oversimplifying things. It seems to have been inspired by some of the same developments that have inspired right-wing movements here in the United States and abroad. First of all, immigration. You recall when Angela Angela Merkel was uh, the head of Germany, she decided to let in 1 million refugees, mainly from Syria and the Mideast, because of the horrible war going on in Syria and the ISIS terrorist movement and so forth. These people were begging to come in. So she let them in, but she didn't do a referendum, which was a mistake. And there's been a, a real backlash because here you have a, a pretty homogeneous cultural society that has a history of um, folkishness, which is uh, identity as Germans, proud identity as Germans. Uh, and you have, and, and, and as Lutherans or Catholics, Christians, and here you have a whole influx of people who look different, who speak a different language, who have a different religion, and so forth. So there's a there was a backlash to that, just as here there's a backlash to the immigrants at our border. Secondly, in the early part of this century, the, the members of the European Union, remember Europe formed a union, a financial and a political union, although it, it doesn't it's not a government in the sense that it rules over uh, the countries. It's just normalized borders and currency. It has one currency and it has brought Europe together rather than splitting it apart. Um, and the Southern tier of countries were having deep financial difficulties, particularly Greece. And there was tension between Germany and Greece because Germany was the healthiest economic country in Europe. And it was being asked to provide um, for Greece economically. And, and the Germans didn't like that. Thirdly, around this same time, um, Great Britain was deciding to leave the European Union and uh, to, to uh, execute what's called Brexit, an exit uh, from uh, the EU. And you may remember this caused quite an upheaval in, in the UK, and it was, it was largely to satisfy the desire for 
preserving a sense of identity as being Britons and not Europeans per se. So it was an identitarian kind of movement. And the Germans looked at that, these individuals who were thinking more in terms of reclaiming their German identity, uh, and they liked that too. They were thinking of, um, in a sense, threatening the European Union, that if it didn't conform to what it wanted to do, that they might leave. And the fourthly, and very, very important, is the sense of German pride. Uh, to a great, great extent, what caused the rise of the Third Reich in the first place was German nationalism and a sense that they had been humiliated by their defeat in World War I. And um, so all of these things taken together will form the nucleus of a new ideology, a right-wing ideology, which we've seen in France and the Netherlands and Hungary and Poland and a number of other uh, countries. The difference is that Germany split. Germany was partitioned after World War II. The Soviet Union never left. It took over the satellite as satellites to the uh, USSR, Eastern Germany, particularly uh, two states in Eastern Germany um, that are significant with respect to the rise of the alternative for Germany, Arthuringia and uh, Saxony. So there began to be a disproportionate support for alternative for, Ger for Germany when it finally formed about 11 years ago with its current name in terms of elections. There never was much support for it in Berlin, but in uh, the Eastern Germany in particular, they're getting now over 30% of the vote, which is enough to basically put local government in, in place there, or what you might say state government in terms of how we would look at it here. So the most current elections for the alternative for Germany for uh, gained about 30% uh, of the vote in Saxony and Thuringia, enough of a threat for the current um, president of Germany to meet with the head of the AFD party and to make a change in his policies. What he did, um, Schultz, is say that they would admit no more immigrants. So he caved on the immigrant question, which is probably the most volatile question right now in Germany and for uh, the radical right. Now, with respect to what this party stands for, aside from German politics per se, and the things I've outlined. Um, it is not a return to the Third Reich. It is not a, third, a return to National Socialism. It has brought in a spectrum of individuals who are highly dissatisfied with the Christian Democratic Party and the other parties in Germany. It's far more to the right, yes. For example, and it's a part of the international backlash against um, marriage equality. And interestingly, a co-deputy or one of the heads of AFD is a woman who's a lesbian who's in a relationship. She lives in Switzerland, but she's still a politician in Germany. And uh, she is uh, in this relationship with, with her partner and they have a couple of children. But she is not in favor of marriage equality. What, what the party stands for is civil union. You recall when we first brought up the idea of marriage equality, Obama wasn't right into that. And he was bringing up the question of civil union, which would be equal to marriage, but not marriage in name. So they stand for that, which is not, it's not acceptable in the United States today, but it isn't what we would really call extreme as in Russia, where you, I mean, homosexuality is, I think, criminalized at this point. Maybe not criminalized, but certainly people are shunned. So that's one thing. There are social aspects uh, to their politics. Another is that um, financially, some of them are uh, quite extreme in terms of the right wing. We have to think more in terms of on Rand here. Um, but 
not all of them. Uh, some of them, uh, she, for example, the woman I just talked about, um, is an economist. She has a PhD in, in, in uh, economics, and she has worked for major investment and uh, banking and other uh, financial companies. And she just doesn't, she has a conservative economic plan. Some of these individuals have been punished by the party for bringing up Holocaust denial, for bringing up aspects of anti-Semitism, which this party cannot indulge in because there are very strict laws in Germany against the expression of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. And they're punishable by actual sentences. So they, they don't want to go near that. But they are very, very anti-Islam. And it's hard to believe that a party that is talking about the folk, which means the white German people of Aryan background, <laughs> and their Heimat or their homeland in Germany, that they would be totally oblivious to other types of um, bigotry. And in fact, there have been private conversations among high ranking members of this party that do expose their bigotry toward non Germans. So there's a great deal of concern about it. Uh, even Marine Le Pen's um, <clears throat> National Front in France, which is their right wing party, doesn't really want to associate with them. And the question today is they seem to be a new party, they're rising fast, they're appealing to the discontent of a significant number of people, and they're exacerbating the split between East and West Germany. Well, some thoughts and questions for you, Jean. Um, when uh, Vladimir Putin was in his uh, earlier years, he was uh, running the KGB in East Germany. And if you run the KGB in East Germany, you make relationships, relationships in terms of political relationships, uh, possibly espionage relationships, relationships. And there's no reason why you would give that up later, especially if you stay in touch with people. So my question to you, in your reading, have you found anything to suggest that East Germany is still connected with the likes of Vladimir Putin? Um, because this sounds like it's a way to disturb and destabilize and divide uh, the Germanys, East and West, again, to return to a time before the the wall came down, before Glasnost, for that matter. Um, and, and that's what we know, that's what Putin would like. Um, is he doing this? Is he involved in this? Is he spreading um, hate and hostility and divisiveness so that this has come about? We have to just look at what he's been doing in America. And the political winds that he's been testing and the chaos that he's been trying to um, facilitate and where his loyalties lie on the American political spectrum. It's very similar. In fact, what I learned from sort of finding out a little bit more about what's going on with the right wing in Europe is that a lot of the things that I hear Donald Trump saying, particularly last night in the debate, with respect to uh, global politics and NATO and relationships with dictators and so forth and his admiration for Viktor Orban tells me that a lot of this is coming from Europe. Uh, we know that um, right-wing um, pundits and influencers have been very, and, and the Republican Party even, has been very um, uh, close to Viktor Orban in Hungary, who's an example of what the AFD might look like if it came into power in Germany. And it's basically an authoritarian movement. It uses democracy. None of them are against democracy because the way they gain power is through the vote in a parliamentary system. You don't have to get a majority 
in a parliamentary system. You don't have to represent the majority of the people to be on top. You can win with a plurality. And fascism, which this basically is an aspect of what I would call soft fascism, um, <clears throat> fascism um, hardly ever gets into power or ever gets into power with the majority. It's always with a plurality. And it's generally through the democratic system. And then once it gets in, it then employs tactics. And if you look at Project 2025 in the United States and you read, it's 900 pages, you don't want to read the whole thing. But if you read a precy of it, a, a general outline of it, it reads very much like an authoritarian system where only one point of view is, is looked upon or uh, is implemented. And anybody with a different point of view is not going to be very privileged and may be shunned or even threatened. So that's been going on in Orban's Hungary. He's got political prisoners in his jails. And it could happen in Germany. And it definitely is happening in Russia. So let's look at the foreign policy of AFD. They are pro-Russia. They are uh, not in favor of the Ukrainian war. They don't want to contribute at all to the Ukrainians. Uh, they want Ukraine to be settled. And by settled, you might think of what Trump said last night when he was asked the Ukrainian question. You know, uh, he, he dodged it, but it became clear from the question that he has said that he, he's going to fix it. He's going to fix it very fast. And he's not going to fix it by providing a penny to Ukraine. That, that's precisely what AFD stands for. So in a sense, if you want to know more about AFD, you kind of have to look at the Republican Party here and the MAGA movement today. Let's look at um, you know how powerful they are. If they got um, uh, Schultz to agree not to take any more immigrants, that's a huge change in policy. Angela Merkel was as far as I know, very popular for her ethical, moral position on accepting immigrants, migrants, um, recognizing, of course, that migrants um, migrate because they, they are seeking sanctuary, they're seeking a, a better life than they had, for example, uh, in the droughts and floods of, of the Sahel in Africa. Um, they can't live there. They can't eat. They can't, they can't grow anything. Uh, it's all climate change, but it's also the politics that come out of climate change. Life is intolerable. That's why they leave. And so I think Angela Merkel understood that. She's a moral woman. And a lot of Germans went along with her, at least for a while. And a lot of Europe went along with her, at least for a while. But then what happened is the, the migrants became very numerous. And some of them perhaps didn't act as well as they, they might have. And then you have um, a resistance that's built up, not only in Germany, but in other countries in Europe. And that becomes political. And it seems to me that this AFD organization is really reacting, at least primarily, to the migrant issue. And I suggest to you, and I'd like your thought about this, is that if there had been no migrants, if Angela Merkel never decided to allow them into Germany. Now, we wouldn't have AFD today. You agree? You know, Jay, that's a very, very interesting question. There are no migrants, to my knowledge, that have come into India, but it has still conducted pogroms and uh, oppression against the Muslim state of Gujarat, particularly when Narendra Modi, the current head of India, was the governor of that state. There really was a riot, we would call it, or pogrom, um, a very kind of genocidal attack on the Muslims by the Hindus in Gujarat. And now that's become part of national policy with Modi. So the sense of trying to purify the body politic is innately fascist. And of course, there are degrees of fascism. But it's very appealing when a country feels that 
it's somehow been humiliated. And this party plays upon that concept. Uh, for example, there, Berlin is a city, and Manfred Henningsen has pointed this out, is a city where there are many monuments uh, memorializing the Holocaust. Um, and Germany has owned up to its past. It has been perhaps the only nation in the world where a genocide took place and it has tried uh, to create enduring monuments against genocide and taking responsibility for what it did. That the people who are heading up this new party are renouncing that. They want Germany. Mm. They, they want to get rid of these monuments to, uh, to remembrance. They're deniers. They're deniers, and they're, they're intentionally forgetting, and they're spreading that notion all around. And uh, what, what I get out of this is that AFD may say, well, we're not really fully fascist, we're not really fully Nazi, um, but we are, you know, we, we like some fascists uh, around, we like some dictators, we, we're friendly with them, and, and, and we're, we're into racial purity and all this. And so you get elements that sound like maybe it's the beginning of something that goes down that road. And the thing about, uh, you know, taking down monuments to the Holocaust, that really does go down that road. So my question to you is, you know, whatever they say today, a, a movement like this, a political party like this can morph. And, you know, maybe there's a plan to morph. Maybe it just morphs organically. But over time, this is a big threat because while they're morphing, they're getting more powerful. They can get uh, Olaf Schultz to agree not to take migrants. That's a huge change in policy. Um, and they can and they can have people elected, and maybe they can actually, uh, you know, have enough people elected to control the government over time. And if they do that, the morphing is going to be all the more obvious, don't you think? It's very uh, interesting to note that this is a new political party. And when you have a new political party and all sorts of people are flocking to it, you have a great deal of instability in terms of the ideology. It so much depends on who's controlling the party, who's at the top. And at various times in the last, say, 11 years of this party's existence, um, different individuals representing different points of view have been on top. The woman I, I spoke about um, who's living in Switzerland and is a co-deputy of the party is part of a wing of the party that's called Mitte, or sort of middle ground. And the other part of the, of the party, which is Der Fugel, is um, extreme. And the fellow in charge who just basically <laughs> won his elections in Thuringia, uh, Hecke, is quite extreme. So that can change, as you say, in a heartbeat. If he's expelled from the party or he leaves the party, as others have done because they've disagreed with stands that have been taken or certain individuals have been um, chastised because of what they've said uh, uh, in terms of representing the party, that, that could be overturned. But once somebody like Hecke gets a, a large percentage of the vote, it stabilizes the party along his his ideology, more or less. It doesn't have a propaganda arm either. So it's not That's the organized well enough yet for us to really know where it stands on the fascist spectrum. Mm -hmm. But we do know that it can morph. In fact, I, I would go further than that from what you've said. It will morph. <clears throat> the people involved will morph. Uh, we don't know what direction, but we know that they will change because it's new and unsettled. But but let me ask you about this though. Um, we have we have Europe. You you mentioned the uh, EU, European Union, and all that. And uh, indeed, if you look at Europe today, the the borders are not really all that secure. Um, you can go from one place to another by train or bus. Uh, in a few hours, 
Um, there's not a lot of control on what Europeans are in what other European countries. Um, and so if I'm a member of this uh, AFD party and I want to go and spread the word in another country, in, say, France uh, or um, uh, the, the low countries or Spain even uh, or Italy or any of the, the Balkans, um, I just get on a bus. I can go. And uh, now if, if I'm if I'm a Muslim, it's going to be more difficult. But if I'm an ordinary European, I can travel. Also, to add that just as in the U.S., um, the information highway is open, um, that you can put propaganda in at one end and telescope it out to hundreds of millions of people instantly. And if you want to spread the word, it's easy to do with social media. And uh, your audience is in, in, in many ways vulnerable um, to social media. So I suggest to you that this isn't limited to East Germany, that it is also um, in process in West Germany. And because of the way Europe is so porous now, by virtue of the, the way the EU works, um, it is it's also um, exposed to the very same kinds of political provocations, political advocacy um, that we have seen taking place in East Germany. And, and by the way, I would add Brexit. I would add the UK because the UK also doesn't doesn't like Muslims. They don't. They want to be isolationist. That's what Brexit was really about. And they have their own right wing movement, you know, British British only movement going on. And we see that in the streets of, 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 of Europe. I'm sorry. We see that in the streets of the UK all the time, especially lately. So I suggest to you, and I would like, you know, your thoughts on this, is that this movement is not limited to the AFD. This movement is um, a kind of a, 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 a marker. Of, move, of a movement that is spreading or likely to spread all over Western Europe. Your thoughts? Well, it, it is. It is spreading all over Western Europe, but not in terms of one party like AFD. Each country has a variation. And if you know a little bit about European history, uh, you quickly learn that even within countries, there are enclaves of people who have a separate identity, even sometimes a separate language from the rest of their countrymen. And they are very patriotic. They are very chauvinistic. So the problem with Europe has not been um, that one ideology can suddenly spread across borders to all corners of the continent but rather that Europe splits up into little enclaves that then go at war with one another. And this is the history of Germany. This is the history of Italy. Um, and so building uh, the larger nation state has been the major um, political challenge of Germany. And for the first time with the European Federation, for the European Union, you actually do have a loose federation that is the glue among these major states that hopefully will avoid war because they have a financial union as well. Now, UK, which itself is very nationalistic uh, and very identitarian, uh, a good part of the UK decided they, they didn't want to be this anymore. But then, Things have changed. They've seen that it wasn't to their advantage. Uh, you have a more liberal government in charge now. And most of these movements, these nationalistic movements like AFD and uh, the National Front and so forth in Europe, have been sparked by the conservative end of the spectrum, which is very traditional, and wants emotionally to feel deep connection with its ancestors and its history and its language and its culture. The thing about 
the right wing parties is they do talk to one another. They do influence one another because they have an umbrella organization. They have kind of a European union of right wing parties and they attend meetings together. They know one another, they talk to each other. They have common problems. Immigration is a problem in France. It's a problem in Scandinavia. For a lot of people, there's been a huge backlash against particularly Muslim immigration. And of course, Europe has a history of great fear of the Muslim religion because when Muslim Islam was on the rise in, during the medieval period, it did infiltrate into Europe, into Spain. There was a caliphate in Spain and there were great battles that were fought in the Polish empire, the Lithuanian Polish empire to halt the spread of Islam into Europe. So it's, it's like people have notions about the people of Central Asia as coming in as hordes and overtaking them. There is this kind of visceral uh, ancestral fear that Islam is going to become dominant. For one thing, the birth rate in Europe has been declining and there's a demographic part of this. Um, the uh, national identity people are not really having enough children to replace themselves. But you have this influx of people from a different part of the world who have a higher birth rate. Now, we know scientifically that as these new immigrants come in and become urban dwellers, within one generation, their birth rate is going to plummet. That's what happens. That's how you reduce the birth rate in a country as you urbanize. But the individuals contending with that right now don't see that. They see the first generation coming in or sometimes a second generation with a number of children. And they, they have this sort of atavistic or visceral fear that they're going to be outnumbered in their own country. So it is racial. Mm. Yes, well, for sure. And it's also religious. I mean, I suspect, um, although they may not articulate uh, anti-Semitism, these right-wing parties are anti-Semitic. Your thoughts? As I said, in Germany, it's hard to tell. And they're being very careful not to broach that topic. They have incorporated some Holocaust deniers. They are pro-Israel, interestingly enough, as, again, the right wing here in the United States. The, the MAGA people are pro-Israel, too, but for their own reasons, of course. However, it's also interesting that Israel is not pro-AFD. They want nothing to do with the AFD. Maybe they see more deeply as to what the AFD uh, really stands for in terms of reclaiming the German folk or the German people as Germans only. And with getting rid of monuments um, that mm -hmm. belie the memory of the great genocide that Germany was involved in. Now, if I were Vladimir Putin, I think this is easy to document, and I wanted to take a little land out of Ukraine, or maybe a lot, um, I, I, um, the, the thing I hate most is the EU, and NATO and solidarity among the countries of the EU and NATO, um, countries that could get together and fund the Ukrainian war, the Ukrainian defense, uh, countries that could provide, manufacture and provide weapons for Ukraine. Um, so that would be my worst, my worst fear, my worst concern. Those are the guys who will undermine my war, my invasion. On the other hand, if I can break them up, if I can divide them, um, then they won't be able to do that. They won't do that. And if I can get a movement going on in East Germany and other right-wing movements in other countries um, who support me and don't support Ukraine and don't want their governments to uh, supply money or weapons to Ukraine, I have achieved an enormous victory on so many levels. So it's clearly in his interest um, to have AFD and other right-wing organizations in Europe. He must be dancing the Kazatska. Um, <laughs> because... 
<laughs> because, because of the emergence of these organizations. More than that, I suggest, as I suggested before, uh, that he is taking affirmative steps to encourage them uh, in ways we don't even know yet, but we can all only surmise that if he wants it and he likes it so much to have so much divisiveness in Europe, it's certainly worth his time and effort to create that divisiveness. And that's where this all seems to be going. It's a war not only of attrition, it's an asymmetric war, and this is part of that war, no? Yes, definitely. That probably is the primary motive of Putin and the Putin regime in terms of what it is interfering with in Europe. And of course, we know that it has been waging cyber attacks. It has been... Uh, paying local criminals to uh, uh, burn facilities that are necessary for transfer of weapons to Ukraine, perhaps even encouraging local criminals to attack um, schools and uh, create social chaos and upheaval as it did in Britain recently with national riots against uh, immigrants and people perceived as immigrants, even if they've been there for two or three generations. So yes, um, ethnic uh, instability, um, actual kinetic attacks on facilities, interference in elections, dissemination of disinformation through social media, and ways in which we haven't even thought of how to disrupt uh, the current um, political and traditional parties of Europe is doubtless going on just as it's going on here. Because well, I want to I want to cover that, but before I do, I want to ask you: Is are the countries of the EU, are the countries of NATO, presumably they they know about this, they live there. Uh, are they doing anything? Can they do anything? Should they do anything? Will they do anything to stop Putin's effort to divide them? They're doing what our national security agencies tried to do when Trump got into office and there was concern about Russian influence in the 2015-2016 election. They have uh, organizations, federal, offices in Germany that we wouldn't have here that oversee the ideologies of certain groups because of what happened in their past. So yes, the AFD is under surveillance. They have a youth group. <laughs> you know, go back to your, uh, National Socialism and the Hitler Youth. They have a youth group that's more extreme than the party itself. Mm -hmm. And they are under surveillance by the German government. A couple of years ago, the German government, to its alarm, found out that the AFD ideology was spreading through uh, their military conscripts, their military. And they began to look more carefully at their soldiers and personnel and to actually um, initiate charges and uh, trials. So yes, they are, they are being monitored. And we know that whatever Interpol is doing or the agencies that are connected, the national security agencies that are connected in Europe are doing, that they are also on top of these uh, multiple attacks and arsons against their transportation facilities and warehouses uh, where they are transferring weapons to Ukraine. Now. Mm -hmm. If the AFD is politically powerful enough to change the immigration policy in Germany, could it be powerful enough to change the policy of Germany toward Ukraine? Because you heard Donald Trump last night say he thinks that he, he did not commit at all for one penny to Ukraine. He said Europe should be doing more and they should be paying their fair share. That's the idea. But Europe is not in a position, uh, Germany is not in a position to increase its uh, financial aid or weapons aid to Ukraine 
under the political conditions of the rise of the extreme right. So Ukraine is caught in this vise politically, which of course, to a great extent, is being encouraged, being encouraged by Russia. And it has Russia has a large foreign contingent of agents. And we know that in our country and also in Europe. And they're very active in sowing discord and encouraging the rise of the right for that, for that reason. Because Russia mostly feels that the longer it's in Ukraine and the more it can hold its line, uh, it's going to win the war of attrition. Yeah, I want to now. I want to turn to the U.S. and um, talk about the politics. We saw the politics uh, revealing themselves, at least for Trump last night at the debate, and um, and then it it makes you remember how much damage he did to American, um, the American alliance with uh, the EU and with NATO, and with all the countries of Europe. He's damaged that relationship as no one else has before. Um, and if he was elected, he would continue to damage it or destroy it. And it's not a question of money. It's a question of some transactional obligation he has and will continue to have with Vladimir Putin. And so, you know, I'm I'm thinking that uh, Trump himself is part of that effort uh, to divide Europe, part of that effort to undermine Europe, European resolve to help Ukraine. And I think we're already seeing that in, in, in play um, as a result of what happened during Trump's, administra Trump's administration. Um, and I think that Germany is uh, concerned about giving more money, more weapons, because of its political strife with AFD, um, and other countries too. And I, I think Western Europe is, is fading on its help for Ukraine. And I don't think we say, I don't think we see it in so many words in the media, but I think that's what's happening. And Putin is, you know, is is is, is having his way. Uh, this is a great concern because uh, by the time we get to the next administration, uh, even assuming Kamala Harris wins, um, she's going to have a real challenge in getting Europe together again in face of AFD and other right-wing groups um, to try to get them together and recommit to funding and providing weapons. Your thoughts? It's hard to deny that. Um, we have a two-party system. In Europe, there's a multi-party system, a parliamentary system. I discussed that they don't need a majority to be in power. Um, here, we have an electoral college. You don't need to be a majority to win the electoral college, and nine out of the last 10 Republican presidents have not had it. They've learned how to manipulate the system well enough to win the electoral college, even without a majority of the population. However, it's hard to compare apples and oranges where you have a multi-party system and a two-party system. In a sense, we're ahead of Europe in terms of our our, our turn to the right, because one of our major political parties, half of our political uh, system, our practical political system, is already where AFD is, and maybe farther along. So we do have a semi-fascist political party right now. I would call them fascist. The GOP is fascist. And it's much more united and organized than the AFD, which is a new party and is still sort of in this sort of ferment. And it has people in power who are going to stay in power and they're going to compromise whatever principles they have to do so because they look to an authoritative leader and they compromise the principles as we have learned people tend to do. And so to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter if Trump wins or he doesn't win this time. He probably will not win, uh, run again the next time, but somebody else will. Somebody who is a clone of him and perhaps a lot more savvy than he is. He's, he's aging. He's not too savvy. He could pull this one out. And if he does, 
now, after four years, the MAGA group is very well organized. It was well organized before in terms of putting judges in place. Now it's organized right down to the municipal level and the state level of uh, conducting elections. <laughs> and so if the DOJ is a Trump DOJ, we're going to see some attempts to change our system pretty fast. Nevertheless, if he doesn't win, Harris is still going to have an uphill battle against a determined fascist movement. And the next time somebody like Trump or somebody that's a clone of Trump will challenge the system further. So we have to live with this dichotomy in the foreseeable future. Well, you know, over the past few years, uh, the Republicans um, in Congress and in other leadership positions have done increasingly, um, they've done things that undermine the uh, the defense of Ukraine. And I think some of that has affected Joe Biden over his term because he gets pressure from them and he gets pressure about, you know, about the the, the, the funding uh, aspect of this. If Congress won't give him any money to defend Ukraine, what, what's he going to do? And I think I agree with you that that will continue. But at the end of the day, what's happening here is that the divide, increasing divisiveness in Europe, uh, as reflected, echoed, or even you know even more ahead of the game, the increasing divisiveness here in this country, uh, political divisiveness, right-wing divisiveness, will ultimately withdraw all support, all support for Europe, let them swing on their own, um, all support for Ukraine, let them fail against Putin's uh, war of attrition. And we will see huge changes between the US and Europe, and for that matter, uh, the liberal world order. Uh, you know, when they say that Trump is dangerous, they don't define just how dangerous he is. But I think this is part of that danger. And it's not just the U.S. Look at history <laughs> in the last hundred years. And uh, with the advent of fascism in name, I mean, as a phenomenon, it probably existed prior to being named by Benito Mussolini. Um, you see how fast the change can be. One of the aspects of fascism as a phenomenon politically is that it creates a very fast change. It moves very fast. When, when Trump says things like on the first day, he's going to do this and do that, that's an aspect of fascism. Fascism has been defined by one of the leading scholars, Robert O. Paxton, as um, rapid action through time, rapid very rapid. And that's where the Blitzkrieg name comes from in Germany, meaning the, the lightning strike. Um, and uh, it, it can be military, but it can also be political and social. And we have seen this lightning strike uh, in 2016, when Trump took power. And it's only moved a little bit faster now. And it, it would be moving very, very fast <laughs> if he got into power. So uh, it catches people unawares, and it strikes at a much deeper level than other political movements. It strikes at our values, our principles, our morals, and our laws. You know, we have a system of law, but what we found out when that system of law is stressed and deliberately bent and pushed and so forth by a determined uh, enemy of the people, the law doesn't always protect us as well as we thought. There are ways around the law. However, when the law fails, what holds? The, the, the center will hold if people stick to their moral principles. But when their moral principles are questioned, uh, or they question, or they, they don't listen to their own moral principles, we have a phenomenon that happens called moral disengagement. And when you are loyal and you and to a, a political figure like Donald Trump or 
Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini. And that figure demands your loyalty and threatens you if you don't give it to them. Um, you will carry out or not interfere with whatever actions, rapid actions they take. And you will become morally disengaged and basically enthralled to a system of behavior that you would never sign on to individually. You lose your moral autonomy. And we found this out through these social psychology experiments. 65%, and that's enough, believe me, of their um, people in their studies um, would sacrifice their morality uh, for their loyalty to the authority. So this group, the um... AFD, and for that matter, the uh, right-wing groups that that surround Trump, uh, they they seek moral disengagement. Am I right? And that and that to a certain extent, they're successful. Um, I would ask you whether we have um, a, a showing of moral disengagement in Europe uh, regarding these right-wing groups, and whether we have a showing of moral disengagement in the US uh, as reflected by these right-wing groups. Your thoughts? The thing about fascism is that it claims to be a spiritual movement. It has its own morality that it puts in place. And we see this in Project 2025, where the family is extolled. We see this in J.D. Vance's comments in the campaign that individuals who have children will have more of a vote than individuals who do not have children, that we should shun those who are single and unmarried, that we um, should uh, per prosecute particularly moral crimes, like um, they're very big on um, homosexuality, you know, that anything, uh, for example, care for transgender uh, people um, and using and, and using the name marriage for the unions of same-sex couples. Uh, that sort of thing, they the propaganda and the ideology is quote moral. But we have to look at it from a different standard. The moral standard that pre-exists it, the one that binds us together today, freedom so that whether you have children or you don't have children, you have the same vote, okay? Equality, so that same-sex couples have access to the same protections in marriage and for their relationships as heterosexual couples. Uh, in terms of how we treat people in our, in our justice system, in fascist countries, loyalty is, is the sin. It is the big sin. And you can be executed for being disloyal. In a democratic country, that in itself is an evil. So we've, we've, we've tipped over our moral compass, our, moral, our basket of moral principles has been utterly changed in the name of morality. But if you look at it, it's not the same thing. There's one principle that stands out when I study individuals who resist authoritarianism. And that one principle is the one that we find in the ancient medical texts. First, do no harm to another human being. Simple. Um, I'm, I'm not any more optimistic after this discussion, um, but I am optimistic about Kamala. Uh, Kamala does, she's faithful to the notions about being decent, about caring for other human beings. And I, I, I surely hope that that will prevail. Thank you very much, Jean. Jean Rosenfeld, uh, helping us understand the right-wing movement in Europe and the right-wing movement in the US and how they're connected, how they follow each other and what, what will happen uh, as time goes on. Thank you so much, Jean. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.